This is the tech stack that I'm using to build my startup and rather than just telling you about the stack I'm using, I want to go beyond that and actually explain why I've decided to use each item in this stack. Oh, if you're new here, I'm Addy and this is episode 7 of a series where I'm challenging myself to build a startup from scratch over 90 days with no prior experience and document everything on this channel. So if you'd like to follow my journey, then hit that subscribe button and check out the rest of the videos in this series. To start off, let me remind you about the application that I'm building. I'm building a single shot video processing application that essentially pre-processes raw footage that you shoot with your phone or your camera to hopefully reduce the amount of time that you spend editing that footage. To use my application, a user would start by uploading their raw footage from their device. Then they'd select what pre-processing they want done. This could be stuff like removing noise, restoring broken audio, color grading, or removing pauses. Then with a single click of a button, the pre-processing would begin. The footage will be sent to a backend server that uses a variety of machine learning models to handle the processing. And after a few minutes, the server returns the process file back to the user, which they're then free to use. And from a technical point of view, it turns out that this is actually a very interesting distributed computing problem because it deals with large file uploads and large machine learning models, which can really slow down a server. And that's exactly why in the previous video of this series, I shared the backend architecture that I designed to solve this problem. So with that in mind, let's talk about the exact tech stack that I'm using to build this application. For the front end, my main requirements are to have an SEO optimized landing page, a login page, and another page to serve the core UI for my application. I'm also going to need a settings page and maybe a billings page for a user to access their subscription details. And to build all of this, I'm going to be using React.js or more specifically Next.js, which is a framework built on top of React. And I'm doing this for two main reasons. The first is that I have quite a bit of experience with React, but I've actually never used Next before. So I thought that this would be the perfect opportunity for me to learn a new skill in a practical way. The second is that Next provides really cool features out of the box that makes it easy to build production level applications very quickly. These are features like automatic page routing, server side rendering, and static side generation for SEO optimization. And what does that actually mean? Well, check this out. When you create a new Next application, you'll see a folder structure that looks like this. Within this app directory, I can define two folders called page one and page two. And within each of those folders, I can define a page.tsx file. Now the components exported out of those page files will automatically be served at URLs that match their folder structure. So slash page one and slash page two. That means that all I have to do is think about the pages that I want my application to support and then build the UI for those pages without worrying about any URL routing. And regarding the server side rendering and SEO, check this out. I've got this React component that's being served both from a traditional React app and a Next.js app. If you look at the HTML file return back for the React app, you can see that it just contains an empty root div which React hydrates once its JavaScript bundle is loaded by the browser. But if you look at the HTML file for the Next.js app, you can see that it actually contains the HTML content of the component. Why does this matter? Because this HTML file is what search engines crawl to understand what your website is about. And because the Next.js HTML file has more information within it, your website is more optimized for search engines, meaning users are more likely to find it, which is a good thing when you're trying to build a business. Okay, let's move on from the front end and talk about how I'm going to handle billings. For billings, I'll be using Stripe's checkout system to handle the actual payment flow and their webhook system to manage subscription lifecycle events. So this basically means that when a user subscribes to my application, Stripe will handle the payment processing and automatically renew any subscriptions and notify my application of any changes in subscription statuses. There's not really much more to be said over here, so let's move on to talking about the backend. 
The backend for my application is divided into two main services, which I spoke about in my previous video. The first one is a simple web API that handles basic stuff like authentication and serving user data. And for this, I decided to use Flask, which is a Python framework for building web APIs. I don't really have a strong reason for choosing Flask other than the fact that I find it quite easy to use and set up. The second backend service is a filter service that's going to do all the heavy lifting using machine learning models to actually process all of the raw footage that a user uploads to my application. So to build this, I'm going to be using Python as my main programming language because Python has extensive support for a large variety of open source machine learning models and frameworks which makes it really easy for me to test out new ideas really quickly. The downside of using Python is that you don't have static typing by default, which can make it harder to catch errors early on during development. But since my application is relatively small in size, I think that this is something that I can live with. Now for this filter service to actually process videos, it needs to know when a video is ready for processing. To achieve that, I'm going to be using a pub sub architecture with the help of Celery and RabbitMQ. Now, Celery is essentially a distributed computing framework, which I'll use to publish job details into a queue, in this case, RabbitMQ. And once this is done, Celery will notify any available filter services to begin the job. This essentially allows all my filter service instances to process video files in parallel without blocking my main Flask server, which means that all my Flask server needs to do is publish job details into RabbitMQ. Next, let's talk about data storage. So for my application, there's two main types of data to store. The first is video files that users upload to my application, which can be massive in size. I'm talking about five, 10, or even 20 gigabytes in size per file. And I don't wanna be storing these files on my server because if a thousand users upload a five gigabyte file at the same time, then we'll need at least five terabytes of storage, which is probably gonna be a pain to manage by myself. So to deal with this, I'm gonna be using Amazon S3 because it can theoretically handle files of any size and automatically delete these files after a certain period of time, which is one less thing for me to worry about. The second type of data that I need to deal with is lightweight user data. I'm talking about stuff like login details, user information, billing information, and so on. And for that, I'm going to be using Postgres. I chose Postgres for a few reasons. The first is that it's a robust database that offers excellent data integrity and asset compliance, which is necessary when handling user data and transactions. The second is that Postgres scales really well. So while my data requirements aren't massive, Postgres can handle millions of records efficiently and has great support for features like indexing and query optimizations. The third is its rich ecosystem of tools and extensions. So for example, I can use Beekeeper Admin for database management and monitoring, and there are excellent Python libraries like SQL Alchemy that makes it easy to interact with Postgres from my Flask application. Now the last piece of my tech stack is infrastructure, or more specifically, where I'm going to deploy and host my application. For the front end deployment, I'll be using Vercel. Vercel is a cloud platform specifically designed and optimized for Next.js applications, offering automatic deployments, built-in CDN, and serverless functions. It's the natural choice since it was created by the same team behind Next and provides you know, seamless integration with the framework. But on top of being built for Next, what made it really stand out to me was the fact that it has a pretty good free tier, which is perfect for my startup's initial launch. For the backend, the main cloud provider that I'm using is AWS, and the main reason for that is just so that I can get better at AWS. Every single job I've worked at has used AWS for their deployments, so I think it's a very useful skill to master. But within AWS, I'll be using two services. The first is S3 for file uploads, which I already talked about. But for my other backend pieces like the Flask server, Filter service, Postgres, and RabbitMQ, I'm going to use EC2. EC2 is basically a server on the cloud, which I'm allowed to configure and use however I like. And I decided to use this over other fancy AWS services to really understand how a server is configured for a production grade application. My reasoning is that once I learn how to do this myself, I'll understand the fundamentals of configuring a server and can then make more informed decisions about using other fancy AWS services. 
And finally, to bundle my backend code before deploying it to AWS, I'll be using Docker. If you don't know what Docker is, it's basically a tool that allows you to bundle your application into a container, which you can think of as an isolated environment. And once that's done, Docker guarantees that no matter where you deploy this container, the code within it will run identically every single time. So yeah, that's the tech stack that I'll be using to build my application. But before you go, I'm also excited to share that I'm nearly done building V0 off my app. So in the next video, I'll start showing you the UI and talk about how I use Figma, which is a skill that I learned recently to design the entire UI by myself. 